want to uh, talk for about 20 minutes about, uh, about uh, Still Brave is the uh, new title. Florence Howe, former longtime editor of the Feminist Press, extended an invitation to our beloved Nellie McKay to edit a 20th anniversary edition of the seminal text, and I'm just going to call it The Some of Us Are Great. Okay, how's that? To um, do a 20th edition of the seminal text, but some of us are brave. Nellie, then professor at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, agreed with, and this is typically Nellie, three stipulations. One, that Stanley James, also a professor at Wisconsin, co edited the volume with her, that Gloria, then now Akasha Hull, Patricia Bell Scott, and Barbara Smith were not interested in updating the volume, which they were not, and that they were comfortable with Nellie and Stanley undertaking the new project. For years, Nellie and Stanley were sister colleagues in the Afro-American Studies Department at the University of Wisconsin, and over those years had collaborated on developing and hosting a number of national events, several centered on black feminisms. This included that first black feminist seminar which ultimately culminated in theorizing black feminisms, the visionary pragmatism of black women, published by Rutledge in 1994 and co-edited by Stanley and Abena Busia, an English professor here at Rutgers University. Nellie and Stanley were comfortable practicing a collaborative, consultative form of transdisciplinary black feminist scholarship that eventually became the Brave Project. One of their first impulses was to organize a symposium and invite colleagues from around the country and the UW campus to consult with them. I'm gonna, I, I wanna, uh, I'm, you're gonna hear a lot of names in this, in this um, uh, narrative because I really think it's important to do this. They included Deborah Gray White, Michael Alquitt, the lone black male, Kimberly Crenshaw, Carol Boyce Davies, Evelyn Hammonds, Darlene Clark Hine, Tara Hunter, Deborah King, Jacqueline Jones Royster, Beverly Gasheftal, and Bonnie Thornton Deal, who was unable to t attend. We gathered in Madison June 8 through 10, 2000, for a symposium that was entitled, Are the Women Still White? Globalizing Women's Studies. There were also, of course, uh, colleagues from uh, University of Wisconsin, whose names I won't mention, and a few graduate students. It, 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 this was a very complex negotiation with, no, with uh, University of Wisconsin because you weren't, in theory, supposed to have an all-black gathering. And so um, we had to invite other people to join us and sit in the room but not participate. This was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you all remember that. Invited participants were asked to facilitate discussions from their disciplinary perspectives around a number of core issues for the future of black women's studies. They were asked to identify critical research questions for black women's studies in the 21st century, as well as assess the similarities and differences from the questions the original editors addressed in the 1982 edition. They were also asked to consider what materials and courses would be critical to the ongoing curriculum development of black women's studies in the 21st century academy. Finally, their advice was solicited on possible contributors to the new volume. The expectation was that scholars would review the articles in the original text and make some general suggestions about updating some of them and adding a few additional ones. Nellie and Stanley would write a forward and introduction. It would be rather simple, they thought. At the beginning, Nellie welcomed all of us and made a short informal presentation, pre presentation entitled 21st Century Vision, Why We've Come Together. Stanley shared a letter from Barbara Smith with the group. Although unable to attend, Barbara expressed her delight that we were committed to revising the text in a manner that would allow it to continue to make a difference in the 21st century, especially in the lives of black women. She want, went on to graciously state, I know Akasha, that's Gloria, Pat and I are genuinely grateful to them, Nellie and Stanley, and I also feel that new life will be breathed into the book and into the field of black women's studies as a whole 
because of the unique insights and perspectives that each of you bring to this project. In her message, Barbara Smith also shared the explicit political intentions of the original co-editors of Brave and included a new charge. This is what she said to us. We want it, it, we want it to be a source for as many readers as possible. The necessary link between academics and activism is best summarized in the words from the introduction. The bias of black women's studies must consider as primary the knowledge that will save black women's lives. In the year 2000, with our lives and the lives of all our communities still in danger, our struggle continues and much work remains to be done. The symposium commenced with clear objectives and intentions and with Barbara's charge. The carefully prepared agenda was promptly and unexpectedly discarded when I blurted out loud that while Brave was certainly a black women's studies text, I wondered in retrospect whether it was a black feminist text. Were these two constructs the same or different and complementary? Historians Darlene Clark Hine, Deborah Gray White, and Terrell Hunter reminded us that there were no articles in the original text on African American women's history, and that for the past two decades at least, they and others had been working diligently to address the silence they had addressed the silence, this silence through the development of a subfield called Black Women's History. To that end, they had actually come to the meeting with a bibliography of the work that they and their fellow historians had produced in the years since the publication of Bray. Some lamented the lack of a diasporic or global dimension in the original text and insisted that the new text attend to that problem. Following a lively discussion, symposium participants generated a number of questions. They included, should new articles be commissioned that would assess the state of the field of black women's studies? Should we approach the task of updating Brave by including the most important or groundbreaking articles that have been published in, since 1982? We also considered including numerous resources, such as updated bibliographies, anthologies, course syllabi, relevant websites, videographies, filmographies, listings of black women's organizations, special issues of journals, conference proceedings, the atlas and atlas of black women in the U.S., and key rulings on legal issues and, them, and their impact on the lives of black women. I mean, we just thought we could have everything in this new edition. What would it mean to create black women's studies in cyberspace? Participants generated a list of themes that should be considered for inclusion in the new text, or themes that had not been adequately covered in the first one, such as religion and spirituality, health, same-sex relationships, bisexuality, black female sexualities, identity, hair, science, and technology. Other suggested themes included color cast and color consciousness and its impact on black women. There was general agreement that the revised text should be a blueprint for critical discourse in the further development of black women's studies. Ultimately, Nellie and Stanley left the symposium with the understanding that they were entrusted with a much more profound task than they had originally imagined. Not only would they need to re reconceptualize entirely the new brave, but their vision had to be expansive enough to address the profound changes that, at, that had occurred in the field of black women's studies and the evolution of black feminisms since 1982. While they were certainly energized by the symposium, they were also in a state of shock. Their sister colleagues and the one brother had thoroughly impressed upon them the magnitude of the task and underscored how important the new Brave project would be so that they had better figure out by themselves how to get it right. Originally, Nellie and Stanley hoped to have the new manuscript at the Feminist Press by 2001, a year later, so that it, it could be published uh, in 2002, the 20th anniversary of the first edition. Nelly, as always, had a prior commitment to organize in 2003 a University of Wisconsin national celebration of the 100th anniversary of the W.E.B. Du Bois seminal text, The Souls of Black Folk. Her health began to fail soon after that important gathering, and she struggled with cancer over the next several years. Before she died in January 2006, Nellie left Stanley explicit instructions to have Francis Smith Foster and me 
share co-editing responsibilities for the new BRAVE project because she knew she would not be able to do that. And we, of course, said yes. Nobody can ever say no to Nellie McKay. The original text, But Some of Us Are Brave, drew together the thinking and scholarship of a relatively small group of intrepid pioneers engaged in creating this new field of study. In the 25 years since its publication, the field of black women's studies has moved beyond mainly literature and history, which you may recall was uh, where the field was in, in 1982, to include more disciplines, especially sociology, anthropology, political science, psychology, public health, economics, religion, the arts, law, theology, the natural sciences. Interdisciplinary areas such as African diaspora studies, popular culture, critical race theory, communications and journalism, rhetoric, media studies, black queer studies, and critical race theory have also contributed as well to black women's studies. When it was published, with respect to the, the history situation, I just want to mention that when it was published, the 16th volume, Black Women in U.S. History, edited by Darlene Clark Hine, Elsa Barkley Brown, Tiffany Patterson, and Lily Williams, was the most comprehensive collection of scholarship on black women's history in the U.S. And we actually went through, Darlene, uh, all of those uh, incredible essays uh, in that volume to try to figure out what we could do with these huge uh, new discipline called black women's history. Perhaps one of the most interesting indications of the coming of age of black women's studies is that its theorists, advocates, and practitioners no longer feel compelled to agree with each other. And this, in turn, has fostered lively debates and disagreements that have enriched the field, uh, that have enriched the field tremendously. Within the academy, there have been sustained efforts to establish cross-disciplinary uh, alliances, while outside the academy, coalitions have developed which is what Barbara Smith and those really wanted, that have facilitated the creation of a more heterogeneous and I would say engaged black women's studies community. By 2004, this is two years after we gathered, uh, Nellie and Stanley had collected more than 200 articles that were important enough to merit consideration for inclusion in the new, new anthology. Many of them were seminal texts from a variety of disciplines and covered a broad range of topics and issues from numerous fields. As they immersed themselves Selves at this extraordinary body of scholarship that had been generated over 25 years, and, and the boxes were just enormous. It became apparent that the new Brave Project had to be a very different run from the original endeavor. By the time Francis and I joined the project after Nellie's death, it was apparent that Still Brave, this is our new title, would not, indeed could not, be a sequel to the original text but rather a retrospective on the state of black women's studies some 25 years later. Although the field is greatly expanded and continues to transcend U.S. borders, we of course were limited by space and therefore had to develop criteria for inclusion in the new anthology, which was a very complicated process and I would say the most difficult professional um, process in which I have been engaged. Seal Brave does attempt to survey the history of black women's studies since the landmark publication in 1982, but it is not in any way comprehensive. We know that our choices are not free of biases. The roots of anthology are anthro, which means flower, and logia, which is collection. In other words, an anthology is a kind of flower arrangement, unique and hopefully beautiful on its own, but by its very essence is artificial and exclusive. An anthology is finally an artifact, artifice, an artifact of its particular editors. Ours is an interpretive collection, one that leads readers toward particular perspectives, while simultaneously suggesting, even re requiring counter anthologies with different arrangements, different selections. We signal this in the titles of the various sections, there are five of them, which all of which come from a song we intend to encapsulate in terms of our choices. Though our choices were painstaking, I want to share with you a little bit of what guided our principles in this almost two-year editorial process. We decided that we would include groundbreaking, foundational, influential essays from a variety of disciplines by both established and young scholars. Although many scholars included here have produced an important body of work in black women's studies, 
we decided to include only one essay from any one individual. This was a difficult decision and resulted, for example, in our not including Angela Davis's groundbreaking essay on black women in slavery because we wanted to include her pioneering work on prisons. We decided not to include Evelyn Hammond's groundbreaking essay, Essays on Black Female Sexuality, because we wanted to include her pioneering work on race, gender, and HIV AIDS. We also were drawn to articles that employed interdisciplinary approaches, where review essays of black feminist discourse surrounding an important topic, or engaged important debates, such as the one which continues between feminism and womanism. We chose not to include excerpts from longer works or essays that have been heavily anthologized and are therefore more, more accessible. Perhaps the most difficult and controversial decision we made, which I'm sure will not please lots of folk, was to focus upon black women's studies within and about the United States. There is limited, though some attention, to the global reach of black women's studies because we anticipate that a second volume will engage the transnational. At a time when US-centric and nationalist perspectives are being challenged, our decision to focus on North America seems almost unthinkable, even to us. However, it was simply impossible to do justice to the pioneering and voluminous scholarship about black women in Africa and the African diaspora since the publication of Brave. This is why we felt compelled to narrow our focus. And I might just say very parenthetically that I teach a course on global black feminisms at Emory and I can hardly keep up uh, with the scholarship in this evolving field. In fact, I tell my students every Tuesday night that I'm just about uh, two books ahead of them. Like its foremother, then, Still Brave is also limited. It does not include reference material, including course syllabi, we debated about this and, and, and just know that people can go to the web. Not all, all of the disciplines or areas of study that have been impacted by black women's studies are represented, such as philosophy, film studies, and I think economics. Like all anthologies, it does not include many essays that belong here. However imperfect this new black women's studies readers might be, we are certainly indebted to Barbara Smith, Gloria Hull, and Patricia Bell Scott for showing us the way and creating a space for the development of one of the most significant, significant curricula and scholarly interventions in the US Academy. We are also convinced, or we would like to believe, that the lives of black women here and around the globe have been enhanced by these ongoing research projects. I'm gonna skip uh, to the very, very end and just say a little bit, though Stanley didn't want me to, about how the book is organized. And she made me promise that I wouldn't say much. Um, okay. Uh, the first section is called The Way We Were. And, and, and we chose song titles for each of these chapters. Uh, so the first one is The Way We Were. And it, of course, begins with the Combahee River Collective statement that was included. This, this is the only um, essay from the original text that, that's actually here. And I don't need to tell you why we included um, that one. Um, that uh, section also includes that really early uh, piece by Michael Alcourt, that first um, essay that a um, black male scholar wrote about his engagement with black feminist theory. The uh, second uh, section is called I Call My Name. It visits and reflects upon debates within black women's studies, and especially the discourse around what we call ourselves and who can claim uh, attachment to black women's studies or black feminist studies. It also insists upon the importance of language itself, the political and personal implications of naming and defining oneself for oneself, or in this instance, who and what defines black women's studies. The next uh, section is called Body and Soul. It, it stresses the inseparability of identities, gender, race, class, religion, and sexuality, and certainly makes visible the importance of intersectionality, which we would argue has been the main uh, contribution that black feminist scholars have made to both African American and women's studies. The next to the last chapter is called To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. It includes compelling essays from scholars in particular disciplines, 
history, political science, literary studies, who demonstrate how black women's studies has impacted these Eurocentric and phallocentric fields. And then the last section is called From This Moment On. It looks uh, to the future and it marks new directions in black women's studies, uh, such as black masculinity studies, which is very um, compelling discourse of the impact of black feminist theory on Caribbean women scholars, a very compelling black feminist analysis of post 9-11 racial and gender politics, and an even more compelling black feminist critique of Condoleezza Rice and the Republican regime of the last eight years. In short, we have placed in company writings that unintentionally enlarge and enhance one another. Still Brave is not a sequel to But Some of Us Are Brave. It is a praise song to those who gave us that gift, that garland of flowers. Still Brave recognizes the courage it takes to respond to, yet not imitate, a major political and academic achievement. Having completed this task, finally, we are humbled and yet hardened as we, as we send it out to you. Hopefully in June, our own bouquet, our own song of ourselves. Thank you.